And um, I, of course, I, I've got, just got to go back to, uh, to Joan Ross's uh, papers to, to get some of the information, but I thought a little bit of history wouldn't go astray. So if you'll bear with me, the first reported cases of polio, or the, the, the so-called uh, reporting of polio, was actually in BC. It was about two and a half thousand years ago. There are some sketches and drawings on some of the, uh, the rocks around uh, the, the old world, if, as it were, that clearly demonstrates um, people with, with um, legs mainly uh, of disfigurement, very similar to many of the, the, uh, the outcomes of, of uh, polio as we know it. The, but um, the first um, reported cases in New Zealand were, was back in, in 1880, and the first major outbreak that was recorded was 1914, in the, um, down in the south, in the Otago Southland area. Um, and it, that outbreak actually led to polio, or infantile paralysis as it was also known, was a notifiable disease. In fact, it wasn't until 1916 that the Ministry of Health had polio, or whatever name they used, as a notifiable disease. But clearly, it was happening long, long before then. And of course, over the, the almost the next century, or certainly up until 1960, when polio epidemics were quite rampant through New Zealand, it was only those who actually were reported by a GP and mainly were hospitalised that we had those numbers. But there are many, many people who would say that uh, they didn't believe that at any time they had actually been, as it were, notified or that the authorities had been notified. So while there is um, statements made that in New Zealand there were about 10,000 people who had, been, uh, who had polio or infantile paralysis, of a variety of ages up to about age 40, uh, clearly there were thousands more who had the, the disease, but not necessarily in a, in a paralytic or in a paralyzing way. So we, we've never known yet as to, um, as to what the exact figures would ever be. Um, the <coughs> it's unfortunate that the the epidemiology, as it were, of, of polio is not very well recorded, and it's people like the late Joan Ross who, who compiled a lot of, um, of the information. What she said was that it was really between 1914 and 1961 that the best records were in fact kept. But again, those were the cases that were actually officially reported, registered um, as that. And of course, by 1961, we had the vaccines, uh, and that wasn't a um, was no longer a challenge. She says in her book that in 1961, virtually full immunisation against polio had been achieved, and there were no more cases of acute polio in New Zealand. Medical students were no longer taught about polio, which joined the ranks of defeated diseases. As elsewhere, polio survivors soldiered on and became hard-working and successful members of society. They also began to experience the disturbing effects that eventually became known as the post-polio syndrome and found no understanding of their problems. Some New Zealand polios became aware of developments in the US of A and two attended the fourth international polio conference in St. Louis in 1987. And then following their report, Philippa Morrison, who came from the Napier area uh, and subsequently became a patron of the, of the New Zealand Society, set out to draw up a register of New Zealand polios and to convene a national conference. And that national conference was actually held in Napier in 1989. And it was at this conference a constitution was adopted and it was decided to apply for incorporation and Alan McAllen, who I thought was going to be here tonight, was the solicitor involved in drawing up the Constitution. And in 1990, the incorporation was granted. And after soup, I'll tell you more. Just carrying on a little bit about some of the detail as far as the, the incidents, if you like, or the history of, of polio in New Zealand. <coughs> 
As I said earlier, it wasn't until 1916 that it was a, officially a, a notifiable disease. And interesting also that up until the 1948 probably, certainly after the Second World War, the polio epidemic tended to run in the summer and autumn kind of November through April, that, that sort of period of time. And there, initially, when it was first started in, as it were, being recorded in, in 1916, it tended to have a real whack, as it did in 1916, and it wasn't until 1925 that there was another great whack. In other words, a, a big outbreak. And then again, it wasn't until 1936-37 there was another significant um, nationwide um, attack, if you like. So just giving you some of the statistics, in 1916, there were over a thousand cases notified. And some of the, our colleagues, past and, and present, kind of thought that the ratio would probably be more like one in five were reported. So that's, that's the kind of um, percentage that has been estimated. And many, of course, were not paralytic necessarily, but certainly they, um, many of the people who now have what is often termed the late effects of polio, um, never registered with the society, for instance, and never went into hospital. So in, in 1916, the figures say that reported in January was 119, February 319, March 320, April 167, and May 44. 1,018 cases notified in 1916. There were a few cases reported each year after that, but they were down, you know, 6, 11, 76 in 1920, 267 in 1921, um, 1924 had 73, and in 1925, 1159. And again, it was in that period, December through to um, April. So it was always kind of associated with swimming, of uh, hot weather, those sorts of the issues. Um, and there are members, members here tonight, there are members right across the country who can remember swimming in in pools that may well have been stagnant and so forth, and there was sort of a, a kind of an alignment with that. The next big year, a big time, was really 1937. And this really was the first time that in the 36-37 epidemic, there was no close-off date of April. It's, it tended to continue on right through. Um, 816 reported in 37, 87 reported in 1936. And then 1943, and I remember that one, uh, there were 179. The schools closed for a week or two uh, as an attempt to try and prevent. And then that became a bit of a pattern for a while. Um, 1945, 1947, 1949, schools were closed for a week or two or three or six in one instance. I think 48 was was big, and then they realised the futility of that. I remember advocating strongly that I should be allowed to go to the pictures because I'd had polio and lightning didn't strike twice. <coughs> but however, um, in 1946-47, um, it was interesting, in 46 there were 113, again um, right through until winter time, but in 1947-48, there were 109 in December of 1947, and there were 963 spread through 1948. And in that, in that year, apparently, it started in, in Auckland, and they measured it coming all the way down south. Other times, it was from the south going north. So it was, it was not easy to, to follow just exactly what was going on. There was a significant um, break, um, breakout, if you like, in 1953. Um, especially in January, March, January through March, 403 cases reported in 53, and in 1955, <coughs> 55, 56, there were um, 
703 cases reported in, in 1955 between October and December, and there was 857 reported in 1956, January through April. And then, of course, um, the, the self vaccine began to, to come in. Um, and uh, in 1961 was the last year uh, when we actually had more in the winter time than anywhere else, but there was a total of 214 notified cases of polio or infantile paralysis in 1961. And by that time, the children had either had the syrup or a jab, and uh, that's where the sulk and the salmon vaccines came in. Now, just very quickly, touching on the deaths, the reality was that there was um, about 10% of those who had been um, identified as having polio who actually died. Many of them were in the iron lung. Many of them, it was not even reported, it recorded in the paper. But just some highlights. In the 1916 epidemic, 123 people died from polio, as there. In 1925, 173. Uh, in 1936 37, there were 44 deaths. 43, there were 24 deaths. In 1948, 52 deaths. In 1952, 57 deaths. And in 1955, 56, there were 79 deaths. So that's back in our vintages, for most of us anyway. Uh, so 835 people died from polio between 1916 and 1961. On average, it was 16 a year. So those are those figures. Now, I want to read to you the minutes of the first meeting. You remember that I said before that there had been the visit to the States, and um, earlier in, in 1989, there had been the conference in, in Napier from where it was decided that there would, in fact, be a steer, uh, post polio support group set up for New Zealand and a steering committee was appointed. And so this is the minutes of the meeting. The post polio support group steering committee held at the Rehabilitation League Napier on Sunday the 5th of December 1989. Present Philippa Morrison, Les Hewitt, Brian Cox, Yvonne Cox, Shane Parks, George Walton, Joe Walton and John Colton. The composition of the steering group as elected at the polio conference were Philippa Morrison, President, Brian Cox, Secretary, Shane Parks, Treasurer, John Colton, George Walton, and it was decided at this meeting to co-opt onto the steering committee Lois Campbell and Les Hewitt. It was agreed that the areas of responsibility would be Pauline Morris, uh, Philippa Morrison newsletter, Brian Cox correspondence, Shane Parks, all financial matters, John Colton, the rules of the new society in conjunction with Alan McAllen, George Walton, liaison among committee members, Lois Campbell, international portfolio. Arising from the conference, A, that private people can get footwear from the hospital on request. There you are. First up, B, that lectures be arranged for the medical fraternity on the post-polio syndrome. C. That a newsletter be sent out containing the proposed rules of the new society as soon as possible so people can write in with their concerns. D. That John Colton collect in submissions concerning the draft of the society rules and that he work with Alan McCallan in an updated version for presentation to the Registrar of Incorporated Societies. Publicity. It was agreed that publicity of the post-polio syndrome be left until the society is officially formed. Clinic. It was agreed that this steering committee keep a watching brief on the formation of a clinic by Disler and Dean. Ministerial queries. It was reported by Philippa Morrison that the appropriate ministers of the Crown had been written to regarding A, how the amalgamation of ACC and the benefit system will affect those people with post-polio syndrome, B, how the area health boards will accommodate the needs of people suffering from post-polio syndrome. Travel fund. There was discussion on how a travel fund could be set up to help people attend future conferences. Suggestions were to approach social welfare to seek sponsorship. No decisions were made. Donation. It was, a, uh, it was decided to ask all members to send in a donation of $10 
to cover the costs of the steering committee over the next nine months. The next meeting at the Rehabilitation League in Napier on the 29th of January 1990 at 2 p.m. unless necessary to bring it forward. There you are. I thought it was tonight's meeting.